Welcome to lecture 16. This is going to be about friction. Friction, together with air drag, is probably the primary reason why it took so long, millennia, to discover Newton's first law. Which is funny, it's very basic, and yet in our surrounding, things always slow down if you don't keep pushing them, for example, right? If you, um, if you push something across a floor, say a box, it's going to slow down, come to rest. So that is why for the longest time people thought, well, the natural state of something is just to, to come to rest if no forces are acting on it. In it. Of course, not true. Um, the reason things come to rest, like a cardboard box that you push across the floor, if you start pushing, is because friction slows it down. So it's a very important force that's kind of everywhere um, and sometimes helpful, sometimes, sometimes less so. Anyway, we're going to study how it works. So we're going to go through the characteristics of friction forces. We're going to discuss the two types of friction. Actually, there's a third one called rolling friction. Um, I'm not going to talk about that um, right now. But we're going to distinguish between those two types. We're going to go through some easy examples. And we're going to try to give a sort of explanation at a microscopic level of atoms and molecules of why there is such a thing as friction. Okay, let's talk about the basics. So friction, in a sense, does two things. It stops things from moving, even though there are other forces pushing or pulling on it. So one example is, think back to the lecture um, on where we had a box on a ramp. Or maybe you think maybe you park your car on a hill would be the same example. But why does your car not just slide down the hill with acceleration g sine theta, like we talked about? Well, it doesn't because there is friction. So EG is an example. Um, is, um, car parked on a hill. The reason it does not slide down the hill is because of friction. If it's too steep or very icy, maybe, then, well, friction might not be strong enough to actually stop it from sliding. Park on a, right on a slope. Um, or maybe heavy cardboard box that, that doesn't want to move. with books and then you try to push it and just not going to budge refusing to move these are just, just some examples it also slows things down that are already moving it's kind of the second second type of effect of friction that we get um, so there let's just pick an example with a car we might think of um, a car braking or driver braking the car and the car coming to rest has to do with friction. Right. Or if you if you finally got your heavy cardboard box to move, well you've got to keep pushing it, otherwise it's gonna slow down and stop. Right? Heavy cardboard box. Box slowing down for you very quickly. Um, and coming to rest when you stop pushing. So, again, I hope this makes sense to you, right? You keep pushing your heavy cardboard box, you want to take a breather, you stop pushing, now you think Newton's first law, it's going to keep going at a constant speed if no force acts on it. Well, Unlucky for you, there is a force acting on it, friction, and it, it slows it down. Okay. So that then leaves us with these two types of friction, and they have different names because they work slightly differently. What stops things from moving, like from not even get going, we call this static friction. And then friction that slows stuff down that is already moving, specifically sliding, um, we call that kinetic friction. And of course, you're familiar with the words static and kinetic already. Static, stationary, um, stasis, yeah, from the Greek, kinetic, again from, from, from the Greek, uh, meaning moving, motion. Okay, so let's figure out what is the difference between them, how do each of them work, what does their strength depend on. 
Okay, so let's make a table. Um, I've put kinetic friction left, static friction right, and the first thing I wrote down is well, what is the basic characteristic of each of them. So kinetic friction slows things down usually, and um, specifically it opposes sliding. So if you think of the cardboard box, you push it along the floor, and it slows down. Right? The sliding across the floor is opposed. There are exceptions where it actually makes something speed up. Like for example, if and as one of the examples I think you're going to work through the homework, um, where you say you drop a bag on a sort of um, conveyor belt, like maybe at, at an airport, a sort of baggage um, belt, you drop it, and it starts moving. Why does it start moving? Well, because of friction with the conveyor belt. But there the belt is, is already moving, um, so the sliding is opposed by dragging the object with it. Um, or you can think if, if you have a rug on a on a maybe a, a wooden floor, so the rug can slide and you sort of jump on it, right? Then um, you might drag it along with you while the friction between your feet and the rug is what got it to slide. So sometimes friction can make things speed up, but be exactly because making something speed up opposes the sliding with the other thing that it's touching, right? So it always opposes sliding. Static friction, on the other hand, um, stops things from sliding in the first place, right? So that was the basic distinction that was distinguishes um, those two. Okay, so what about the direction of the force? The force is the vector, right? Well, kinetic friction, if you think about it, if I push the box, if the box is moving to the right, if the friction is going to act to the left, it's going to create an acceleration of force to the left. If I push my box to the left, well, then friction is going to act to the right. Again, always trying to slow down the box. Um, so, so it opposes, so in terms of direction, let's write this down, it opposes the relative velocity. What do I mean by relative? Well, I included a word to mean well relative to the other object that it, the, the thing is touching, right? So if you imagine the... Um, the cardboard box moving across the floor, well, its velocity is to the left relative to the floor, right? The floor is our frame of reference. Um, if I were to drop that my suitcase on the, the, the conveyor belt at the airport, well, in that case, the velocity, if the conveyor belt is going this way and I drop my suitcase like on, onto it like this, is my suitcase is the conveyor belt, right? Here, belt going this way. And I'm going to drop my suitcase, right? Then the belt's moving this way. So relative to the to one spot here, the, the suitcase appears moving to the right if it's not moving, so it gets dragged along to the left. These are the slightly more subtle cases. Um, but it is intuitive. It is fairly intuitive um, which way kinetic friction acts. Okay, what about what about static friction? Well here the direction is I'm gonna write it down in the following way. Let's say opposes potential acceleration. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's nothing's moving in the case of static friction, right? Right, Your car is parked on the hillside, but it's not moving. So there's no acceleration. I can't say the, the friction opposes acceleration. But I know friction has to act up the hill because well, gravity is trying to pull the car down the hill, and the reason it's not moving is because something is opposing that. So it opposes, the direction of the force opposes the, the way in which the object would accelerate if there wasn't friction. It's kind of a slightly more roundabout way of saying it. Um, so let me write this down in opposite direction. Of um, um, the direction... in which the object would accelerate without friction. So sometimes you can play a little mind game where you are um, accelerate without friction. Play a little mind game where you imagine, well, what would happen in this scenario that I'm looking at? Maybe the box on the, um, on the ground or the car parked on the hillside. What if it the ground were made of like a perfect sheet of ice. 
perfectly smooth and slippery. What would happen then? That kind of game, just playing it out in your mind, can help you figure out um, what's the direction of, of static friction. Right? It opposes that acceleration that would occur if friction wasn't there. Um, again, it's fairly intuitive, but sometimes like, there are subtleties. So, so, but hopefully, hopefully this, this makes sense to you. Now, how strong is it? So let's think about what it depends on. Right? What does what does the force of friction depends on? If I push something across the floor, well, um, how quickly is it going to come to rest? Well, let's think of some examples. So the cardboard box on the floor probably comes to rest fairly fast. If it's dimensional, push it and it stops, right? Um, I might be able to slide something across a sheet of ice for a while and it takes much longer to come to rest. So, um, So, so one thing it depends on, it depends on the, the types of material that are touching. Right? Is it a sheet of ice? Is it two sheets of metal? Is it cardboard and wood? What is it? Right? What types of material are touching? And roughly speaking, we might say this will depend on the roughness of the surface, though so that's only a, um, it's, it's a sort of a very vague guide that's not always quite accurate if you think of it that way. But it gives you the right idea. Types of materials um, that are touching. So now the next thing you can do, figure out what else it depends on, is, is do a little experiment um, that you can do right now. So take a book. I'm not going to use a book because I can't fit it on this camera space. I'm going to use this little pad of paper. Um, so, if I want to push this, right, what's going to happen is I, I'll push it, and I maybe push it with a pencil here. I keep pushing it, right, and I can I could apply a little bit of a force to oppose the friction to keep it moving. Now, imagine this. Imagine I'm going to stack something really heavy on top, and I don't have anything really heavy um, right here. I've got I've got my coffee mug, right, it's full of coffee, a bit dirty. I must not use it. Um, maybe I can I can put this. This, this thing of pens and pencils on it, right? Let's imagine I put this on there. So what, what's going to happen then? I'm going to take it off so you can actually see. Imagine there's something heavy on this. Maybe we can just push down, right? I push down with my hand. So what that means is now it's going to be way harder for me to move this and keep it going. I have to push a lot harder, not because this hand is opposing the force, but just because I'm pushing down or I'm having something heavy stacked on top, right? Now, having something heavy stacked on top, I mean, it seems strange. Like, does, does the weight of the thing change anything? The mass? Um, no, because when I push down, when I get the same effect, I push down, and it makes it a lot harder to keep the thing going sideways. I have to push, like, a lot this way. Um, so what is, what's that up? What, what, what else, what's going on there? Well, what you're changing when you push down or when you stack something heavier on top is the normal force between the surfaces. Now we could do experiments. You just have some basic equipment and maybe a sort of force sensor that measures the strength of forces, the spring, right? The spring, how much does it stretch? That's the way to measure forces. Um, we could measure and what we could figure out actually is that the force of kinetic friction is proportional to the normal force. Um, when I say the surfaces, I of course mean the two surfaces um, that are touching, right, that are between which there's friction. So in, in my case of this, this pad or the book you might have near you, it's going to be the underside and the paper right here, right. So there's friction between those. And there's a little bit of it, let's push it like this, because a little bit of normal force between them. That's what's stopping this pad from falling through to my desk. But if I push down hard with this hand, I'm trying to move it with this one, I have to push a lot harder. It turns out normal force is proportional to the kinetic friction that you get. And so one way to write this down is to say the force of kinetic friction, I'm going to write it as kf right now for kinetic friction 
is equal to I'm going to write this. I'm going to write it first, and then I'm going to explain it. Mu k times times the normal force. Right. So let me explain what I mean by this. So this this symbol here, especially. So this is my force of kinetic friction. What is it? What is is its strength? This is the normal force. I mean, I can relabel it. I can just do that um, like this. Oops, broken pencil tip. This is the normal force, right? This is my kinetic friction. Now, this thing here, um, this is a Greek lowercase letter mu. Uh, <laughs> writing is writing again. Um, mu, so you just write it out like this. It's pronounced mu, at least in, in English, right? Um, it is essentially like the Greek M sound, right? This is its lowercase. So, and then it's a to subscript K with a for, for kinetic. Because we're going to have a different type in just a second. So, it's subscript K for kinetic. We call this the coefficient of kinetic friction. Right? Because we're talking about kinetic friction. Stuff right here, kinetic friction, things moving relative to each other. Um, and this is called a coefficient. And the coefficient is determined, it's kind of encoding what the, the properties of the two surfaces. Like how strong is, the, how rough are they on each other. So this just depends on the, the, the two surfaces. It's usually, and pretty much always, between 0 and 1. So maybe it's 0.5 for some some um, some materials. Maybe it's 0.8 or 0.2 or 0.001, right? Something like that. Um, it is occasionally it can be bigger than one, but that is very very rare. Um, zero and one, and it depends. The value depends on the materials and nothing else. So I can go and I can look those up. I say wood on wood, right? And you could look up the coefficient of kinetic friction for wood on wood. And then there might be differences depending on how well the wood is polished, right? Or you can look up brass on steel or rubber on concrete, right? That's important for driving. Um, or maybe wet concrete and dry concrete. You can sort of separate them out. So it depends only on those. So, so you just have to look those up. And if you come across a problem, maybe in your homework, where it doesn't give it to you what the value is, but it tells you what the materials are, you can look it up. So there's tables for that. Um, so there are there's some basic ones in your textbook, and there are really long ones online for all sorts of different types of metal on each other, different types of wood on each other. Um, and so on, so on and so forth. So, but this factor here is the proportionality factor between the force of kinetic friction that slows this stuff down and the normal force. If I double the normal force, I'm going to double the force of kinetic friction. Well, if this is 10 newtons, this is 0.4, this would be 4 newtons. But if I double the normal force to 20, well, 20 times still 0.4 would be 8. Right? So that's the kind of calculation. We're going to do lots of it. Okay, um, how about static friction? Does it work the same way? Yes and no. So, if we think back to our cardboard box or book on the table, I'm going to again use my little um, pad here. Just like before with the kinetic friction, where I had it going already and I tried to keep it going, if I imagine I, wa I want to keep it going, what I might do is this. I might push against it. At 0.1 newton, it's not budging. 0.2 newton, it's not budging. 0.3 newton, so not, now it's going. Right? So the strength. So what's the strength of it though? Well, right now, it's just sitting there, there is zero friction because there's no potential acceleration. Nothing is trying to make it go. If I push against it, this way, right, to the left, this way, um, 
with 0.1 newton and it's not moving well that means that the force mass the friction force must be 0.1 this way right if it wasn't then if it was 0.3 it would be going this way because there'd be a net force to the right so the friction force is sort of a, it sort of adapts right static friction adapts if i push it with 0.2 newtons to the left then the friction force pushes with 0.2 newtons back now say i go to 0.3 still not moving but i go to 0.3 one newtons and now i'm starting to move well that means something happened at about 0.3 or um, 0.31 newtons when suddenly the the friction force couldn't keep up so there's some kind of maximum right that's a crucial distinction from kinetic friction where this is just the force of friction in static friction well right now it's zero if i push against it with 0.1 newtons it's 0.1 newtons it opposes the force that it opposes the net force that's there without the friction um, if i push with point Two newtons. Well, it pushes back with 0.2 newtons, assuming it's not moving. Right, I'm going to push down a bit. If I push with 0.6 newtons, it's still not going. Well, then the friction force is 0.6 newtons. But if if once I push with two newtons, okay, now it's moving. Well, that means I've sort of overcome some kind of maximum of the force of static friction. Um, so. The basic idea here is it's as strong as needed to stop the motion. That's that's important. Static friction does does not make things accelerate. Right? Unless the thing is it's sitting on is accelerating, right? But it, it doesn't do relative acceleration. So if I want to move this my whole page. Right, of course, then friction between my sheet and the pad is what accelerates the pad because I'm not touching the pad directly. Right, I'm touching my piece of paper over here. Uh, but again, it just opposes the motion. So as long as needed is to stop motion, really it's to stop sliding. But only up to a maximum value and that maximum what does that depend on well that depends on those same two factors we had over here so the maximum how hard do i have to push before this starts moving well if i imagine i push down hard on it or i stack a bunch of books on it or weights i'll have to push a lot harder before it starts moving right a cardboard box full of books is harder to get going to get to move at all than a cardboard box it's just empty and sitting on the same floor um, so we have we have again the normal force and the the type of materials have to maximum and at maximum that depends on the types of material Same thing as before, and the normal force between the surfaces. And so what we have here is that the force of static friction, um, it is what it needs to be. Let me write this down first. bit like the normal force right the normal force is as big as it needs to be to stop something from falling through something else or from moving through something else similarly static friction is kind of what it needs to be to to, to stop um, sliding but it is always going to be smaller or equal right smaller this this is smaller or equal than let me write it down than this Again, this is the normal force, and this is called the coefficient of static friction. That's, that's why there's the S there, right? Here at kinetic friction, here I've got static friction. Write this down. This is called the coefficient of 
static friction. And that is also between 0 and 1. So I'm going to uh, sort of make put the error over here just because I'm lazy. Then I'm going to write it all out again. But usually, pretty much always, I can't think of any exceptions here. Um, my exception wouldn't really make sense. The coefficient of kinetic friction is smaller than the coefficient of static friction. I mean, it, it kind of has to be, otherwise like, it doesn't make sense whether it's moving or not. Um, so you might just, might just not write each. Right. So for example, um, if you take two materials, then say wood on wood, it might have a coefficient of kinetic friction, that's 0.3, coefficient of static friction, that's 0.5. I'm just making up those numbers right now, right? You can look up the actual values. Um, for tires on concrete, the coefficient of static friction it's very close to 1, so it's 0.9, depends a little bit on the details here. Um, so, you know, um, rubber tires on dry concrete, 0.9, and coefficient might be something like 0.65. So it's always smaller than this, but they're always between 0 and 1. There are some metal-on-metal -metal values where this is 1.1, for example. But as I said, that, that's very, very rare. Okay, now... To actually apply this, we're going to look at some examples. Um, now, I want to emphasize one thing. Air drag is not friction. Right? We're going to talk about air drag separately. It works differently. Because what's crucial about those expressions, if you look at it, they don't depend on the speed of the object. I mean, here the speed is zero, but, but here... So it does not depend on speed. That might be a bit counterintuitive. Right? So if you push your cardboard box or like along a um, hallway, it's full of books, you have to push pretty hard to keep it going. Well, how hard do you have to push to maintain the speed to cancel out kinetic friction that does not depend on how fast you're going? And that is going to be different with air drag. Like air drag works differently to friction. So please, uh, please don't confuse them. Even though they have similar effects and that they tend to slow stuff down, they're so called dissipative forces. Okay, let's now just do some examples. So here's our first example. Let's use that cardboard box we've been talking about. So here's my cardboard box, and I imagine it's full of sand. Why would you do that? I don't know, but let's just go with it. It's full of sand, and so the whole mass of this cardboard box is 80 kilograms, and it's sitting on some kind of floor, maybe some kind of linoleum floor, I don't know what. Um, tiles doesn't really matter. It, it conveniently has the word floor written all across it, um, so you know it's the floor. Okay, and what we're told is that the coefficients of friction between this floor and the cardboard box or the cardboard, right, is the material, is 0.3, that's the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, whereas the coefficient of static friction, mu s, is given by 0.5. Notice that those, those values, they don't have units, right? They don't have units because, let's just go back here for a moment, this is in newtons, this is in newtons, so this is a nothing, right, because newtons equals newtons. Any other unit would like would mess up that equality. Would make sense anymore? That's a ratio of forces. This over this. So it doesn't have any units. Um, and now we want to figure out. Well, what force do I need? And I imagine I'm trying to push it. Maybe I'm going to push it this way, right? What force do I need to push that cardboard box? Let's call these parts A, B. And see. Well, let's do part A. To get going, I need to overcome static friction. Let's draw a free body diagram. So it has a weight, and of course, we understand what that weight is. The thing is 80 kilograms, right? 80 kilograms, that is mg, which in this case is going to be 800 newtons, because we assume this is on Earth. 
right? So 80 times 10 G, it's 10. It then has a normal force acting on it, right? That's what stops the box from falling. And we know right away the, um, the normal force Fn is probably going to be also equal to 800 newtons to cancel out the weight. Why is that? Because friction acts parallel to the surfaces. It's something you could have written down. Um, it, it, friction does not make you take off or push you into the ground. It, it always acts parallel to the surfaces. Um, so, so if I'm trying to push it, right, the, this be my, my push with my hand, then if there was no friction, that would be it, right? That's my picture, and then the push would be equal to ma, a Newton second law, of f equals ma, right? That I work on the acceleration. But here there's friction, and if the, you push this way, then friction is going to exactly oppose that with the same force. That would be my free body diagram. Now, you could imagine I start out pushing with one newton. Well, the box is not going to give. The friction is one newton, canceling it out. If I push with two newtons, the friction goes up to two newtons. It, it adapts, right? So to get it going, I have to overcome the maximum. Let's write this down to get going. We need to overcome the maximum. The breaking point, the maximum static friction. So we need um, that our push has to be greater or equal to um, the force of static friction, the maximum. We write it like this, so the max up here. You may say, look, this is the maximum. Um, and of course, that's equal to mu s times n. Sorry, sorry, normal force, F substitute N. That's what I call it here. Because N is for Newtons, right? Um, F subscript N. So I all know those values, right? To get it going, these things are not moving. I'm using static friction here. And that was that value was 0 0.5, which I was given up here in part of the question. And then the normal force in this case. Well, the normal force is also equal to 800 newtons because it cancels this out, right? Because uh, I mean, we've done that kind of calculation. The things are moving up or down. So that's 400 newtons. So that's how hard I have to push to get it going. Well, technically, I have to push with 401 newtons, right? Or 400.01 newtons. This is a teensiest bit greater than 400, so I can break the static friction, as it were, and get the thing moving. Okay, let's do part B. Part B is asking, um, we need a force I need to keep going at a constant speed. So, to keep going at a constant speed, um, what I should have perhaps added here, is that this is, uh, this down here is static friction, because when we want to keep going at a constant speed, we're already moving, well, now it's going to be kinetic friction that opposes the um, the motion. So let's draw our free body diagram again. It's going to look ever so slightly different. So the weight hasn't changed, right? Because gravity doesn't care what you do. It's still mg, which is still 800 newtons. And the normal force is still up because our ground is presumed flat. I'm just going to write Fn. Now, Let's assume the object is moving to the right. It's moving this way. Right? So that implies that friction, right, static friction opposes, sorry, kinetic friction, excuse me, kinetic friction opposes the direction of motion. It opposes the velocity, the velocity to the right. So static friction has to be to the left. Keep saying static. Kinetic friction, we're moving now, aren't we? Static friction was part A. Um, kinetic friction, because the, the cardboard box is already sliding across the floor. So kinetic friction points left. Now, 
if that were the only forces acting, so you stop pushing, you can see what happens. There'll be an acceleration this way, right? There's a net force to the left, acceleration to the left. So therefore, we would be slowing down because right now my velocity is to the right, and acceleration to the left would mean we're slowing down. Um, so to, to overcome this, we have to push in the opposite direction. And here we choose to make it equal to kinetic friction. Let me just annotate this. Choose to push, because we can choose how hard we want to push, um, with a force that exactly cancels out the kinetic friction. Right, if I push a bit harder, I'm going to get acceleration. If I push a bit less hard, I might, the box might be slowing down. So, kinetic friction doesn't care about how hard you push. Right? That was static friction. Static friction opposes the force that would make something go. Kinetic friction just opposes with a given strength, and it opposes the, the actual motion just to the right. Never mind what other forces do. Um, cancels out kinetic. So, kinetic friction, though, is what? Well, um, so sorry, it's done first. Push is equal to kinetic friction. And that is true by our choice to keep going at a constant speed, by our choice to push it just hard enough to not speed up or slow down, which is equal to mu k times the normal force. Now, the normal force is still 800 newtons because it so it just cancels out the weight, there are no other forces in the vertical direction. And the kinetic force, the coefficient of kinetic friction was 0 0.3, right? That's what we what it probably told us right here. And so we multiply that by 800 newtons. And so we end up with 240 newtons. So compare this, compare those two answers, right? 400 newtons to get it going, 240 newtons to keep it going at a constant speed. So that is why when you imagine yourself doing this, you're actually pushing this cardboard box, right? You can sort of imagine I push it, it's hard to go, but once it gets going, it suddenly sort of lurches forward. But why is it lurching forward? The instant it starts moving, the instant you're pushing hard enough, well, because the moment you push with 400 newtons or 401 newtons, you break the static friction, right? You reach the maximum. That means the box is moving, so it immediately switches to kinetic friction, which is 240 newtons, which means right now you're pushing with 400, but friction is only 240, and so suddenly you're sort of over pushing by a lot, and it'll make it, well, accelerate, and that's the lurch forward. Um, let's take just part C, right? Force, so we asked to find a force to accelerate at 0.5 meters per second squared. So for part C, we want A to be equal, our acceleration, right, to be equal to 0 0.5 meters per second squared. Now, to make that work, we need a net force F net that is equal to the mass times the acceleration. That, that's Newton's second law. The mass is 80 kilograms. Notice this is the mass, not the weight, times the acceleration that we want is 0 0.5 meters per second squared. Um, that comes to 40 newtons. Right, that's the net force, not the force of my hand, that's the net force. Well, what forces are acting? Same as before, weight and normal force, those are the easy ones. The weight, the normal force, the static, sorry, the kinetic friction, because we're already moving, kinetic friction is, is what it is, right? Kinetic friction does not care how hard you're pushing only cares about, well, are you actually sliding or not? So yes or no. Um, 
and I'm pushing with a force that's greater because I want a net force to the right. right so we get net force F net is up and down, there's no F net, but F net in the horizontal direction. Let me just write this down. Horizontal is going to be the push minus kinetic friction. Which is, well, I don't know what the push force is, but I know that um, the, the net force is that I want is 40 newtons. So that's equal to the unknown push force minus, I know what kinetic, fr kinetic friction is, that is um, this one, that is mu k times the normal, normal force, Fn, sorry. I used to write just capital Ns for normal force. I just got so confusing with the Newtons that I tried to switch to this, uh, but sometimes I slip back to putting a big N in there. Um, so if you catch me and I don't catch myself, well, you know why I'm doing it. Um, N is for Newtons. Um, what is this? This was 800 Newtons. This was 0.3, so it's at 240 Newtons. We can easily see then that the push force must be equal to 280 Newtons. Now another thing you could work out is if you start at part A, right, and you sort of push, 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 make it stronger, but the box is not moving, and then suddenly it's moving, right, so you, it's, you reach the breaking point by pushing harder and harder and harder until you reach 400 Newtons, well now the box is going to switch to um, kinetic friction, that's 240 Newtons, what is the acceleration at that very instant that a box starts moving? Assuming you pushed with, you know, 400 newtons or 401 newtons just to, to get it going. Fun little um, problem to think about to make sure you've understood the concepts we've talked about so far. Here's our second problem. Um, we imagine we're skiing downhill, and as I've drawn it here, we're skiing down a 30 degree slope. And I've got a coefficient of kinetic and static friction for ski on snow. Of course, it depends on what type of snow it is, how smooth are you ski, do you, have you waxed them recently, etc. So I'm just going to go with those values. The question is, well, what's the acceleration if you're already moving? So we're assuming, you know, you're pushed off, you're already moving, while you're going down the hill, what's going to be your acceleration? Well, A is the force divided by the mass. Well, what force? The net force. Now, I don't know the mass, right? You're like, wait a minute, I don't know the mass. Like, don't I need it? Well, let's see, right? We have to work with it. Let me call the mass M. Right? I don't know it, but let's work with it. Maybe it'll cancel out or something. So, what's the net force? Well, to figure that one out, let's just draw what the forces are that are acting in this case. Um, clearly, it's going to be a weight. And the weight is what it always is. It's mg because gravity does not care. That's a normal force, right? Because, well, we're touch surfaces touching and the skier is not just falling through the surface. Then it's normal force straight up. No, it's not because we're on a slope. Remember, the normal force is normal. It's perpendicular. So it points in some direction like this. Um, now, our velocity, right, is downhill. We assume we're already going downhill. Um, if you're skiing uphill, like, you know, you came down a slope going up the other side, well, it's a different problem that you can think about how quickly are you slowing down if you're going up the hill. But we're assuming we're moving this way. Don't know how fast, but we're moving that way. So that means that friction is going to oppose go this way, right? And which friction is it? Well, we are already moving, so this is going to be kinetic friction. If we just stood there on the top of the hill and have, are not moving yet, friction is holding us in place, that would be static friction. But here we are already moving. It's part of our problem. And that's it. So we've dealt with this scenario before where we didn't have friction, right? We talked about stuff on slopes. So 
let us do our xy coordinate system and we're going to do what we did um, the last time there we're gonna, we're gonna define x and y like this x y down the hill and perpendicular to the hill and of course i want to know my, my x direction so what are the, the what is the net force in the x direction well there's there's the the weight that's pulling me forward um, Right, and that is going to be m g sine theta. That's what we talked about in the last lecture, the one before. Can't remember. Um, so hopefully you know where it comes from. Right, it's a downhill component of the weight. If you don't remember this, if it doesn't make sense to you, go back to your notes or to the previous lecture. Um, this is downhill, but then now we're getting slowed down by kinetic friction. So if we subtract that, because kinetic friction is pointing in the negative x direction, positive x is downhill kinetic friction is pointing in a negative x. What is kinetic friction? Well, it's just going to be, let me color code this for you. This is mg sine theta. And we're going to subtract from it mu k, kinetic friction, times the normal force. Okay. I don't know the mass. I don't know the normal force. It's looking pretty grim. Well, let's not despair here. We have a y direction too. This was my x direction consideration. Now we consider the y direction. What's happening there? In the y direction, we know that there's no acceleration at all because the skier is not taking off in this direction, nor digging down in this direction. So that must be zero, plus the net force is zero. Or I might say that the normal force Fn is going to be equal to the into the hill component of the weight, which we figured out was mg cosine theta. Okay, so can I can I work with this? Yes, because now I can take this expression here and plug it into here. So what we're going to get is that the acceleration is mg sine theta minus mu k and now mg cosine theta right i've just plugged this into here of course all divided by m because the thing in the numerator that's the net force down the hill now interestingly you can look at this oh the mgs are going to cancel out actually i'm going to factorize it first a little bit just to make it a bit neater mg sine theta minus mu k cosine theta divided by m. Now we can very clearly see we can cancel out the m's, which is fantastic, right? We don't know what the mass was. Turns out we had to work with it, but it actually cancelled out. Um, now in real life, you may or may not know what the mass is, right? In the problem here, the problem, of course, you know, assumes you knows you can get to an answer. So, you know, we, if you have enough experience, you know, you anticipate oh, it's going to cancel out. But our approach was, well, let's just write down what we know, right? And we'll see if we can solve it. Turns out, yes, we can, because the M cancels out. So we are left with G sine theta minus mu k cosine theta. Now it's just a matter of plugging in values, right? This one here is 10 meters per second squared. This is 30 degrees. This is, well, which one is it? Point 0.1, right? Kinetic friction, the coefficient of kinetic friction. And then this one is again 30 degrees. I have all the values. I can plug it in. Now you plug it into your own um, calculator or do it in your head if you can. And I think I think what I get to is 14.14 meters per second squared. It's going to be the acceleration down the hill. And without friction, without this part here, it would be g sine theta. It should come to 0.5 exactly. Sorry, 5 meters per second squared so but with friction is a bit less 4.14 hope that example um, made sense to you as the last part of this lecture very briefly i want to sort of explain why friction works the way it works by by imagining to zoom in onto those surfaces so we're going to zoom in with our, our microscope to where the two surfaces of say the cardboard and the floor where they're touching 
Now, if you do that, you find they're not perfectly smooth surfaces, but they're sort of raggedy. Um, now, I just drawn some raggedy shape here. I don't know what cardboard actually looks like. It might be somewhat irregular too. I don't know what the say linoleum floor actually looks like. I do it like this, you know, sort of a different type of raggedy. Um, and and really, if I could zoom in further, I could see sort of individual like molecules arranging themselves in some way. Um, so it's not just a smooth flat surface if you zoom in far enough. So what it means is when those two surfaces are pushing against each other with a normal force between them, right? When a normal force is like little springs, they get squeezed. Then these sort of these raggedy bits, these teeth, the way I've drawn them here, right? They're gonna sort of squeeze in there. Let me see if I can draw this. Maybe I'm super super fast here. Um, this is my one surface, and now my 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 teeth might sort of be stuck in here. And all right, so this is my cardboard. The same thing is again. They they're stuck inside one another, which makes it hard to slide them sideways. It's like of like two blades, two sort of saw blades like this, sort of pushing against each other, it's hard to break them apart. Um, now, actually, if you talk about this a little bit more carefully, you can talk about um, sort of temporary bonds, like molecular bonds forming between this bit and this bit here that have to be broken if you're trying to get it to move and so on. But let's just stick with this ruggedy sawtooth picture. Well, you can imagine that if you push them together, right, they're going to be stuck like this and going to take a lot of force to sort of rip off the tops of this or so to get it get it moving sideways but once you're moving sideways you're sort of dragging it across and yes it's still it sort of gets caught a bit there's still kinetic friction but it's not as badly stuck as it was at the beginning with static friction it's an, actually a little bit like imagining you're trying to saw through a piece of wood right and if your saw is a bit blunt the wood is really hard might be difficult your saw gets stuck but once you get it to slide a bit, it's easier to keep it from keep it sliding, at least until you have to like change direction and it gets stuck again. That's the kind of picture you can keep in mind that will help you understand why friction works the way it works. All right, the next lecture, we're going to go over just some more examples of how you might measure um, the coefficient of static friction, just some more applications to get good at this stuff. I'll see you there.